Electric current in a conductor is due to the flow of charges. A constant potential difference across the ends of the conductor is required to maintain the flow of charges through it. For this, a source of electric current is required. The device that helps to maintain the constant potential difference across a conductor and thereby the continuous flow of charge through it is called an electric cell. An electric cell has two terminals, one positive and the other negative. When a conductor is connected to the terminals of an electric cell, the chemical reaction inside the cell helps maintain the flow of charges through the conductor. That is why an electric cell is also referred to as an electrochemical cell. The work done by a cell to drive a unit positive charge in a closed circuit is called electromotive force, EMF. Thus, an electrochemical cell is defined as a device that converts chemical energy into electrical energy. There are two types of electric cells primary cells and secondary cells. In primary cells, the chemical reaction is irreversible. Hence, current can be drawn from this type of cells until the reactants last. Once the reactants have been consumed, current cannot be drawn. The voltaic cell, Leclanche cell, Daniel cell, bichromate cell, dry cell and button cell are some examples of primary cells. In a secondary cell, the chemical reaction is reversible. Thus, a secondary cell can be recharged and reused. Lead acid storage battery, nickel iron cell and nickel cadmium cell are some examples of secondary cells. Let us now discuss the construction and working of the voltaic cell. A voltaic cell is the simplest of all devices used to produce a steady current. It was invented by an Italian physicist, Alessandro Volta. The EMF produced in a voltaic cell is of the order of 1 volt. A voltaic cell is made up of a glass vessel containing dilute sulfuric acid, a copper rod and a zinc rod immersed in the glass vessel and conducting wires connected between the copper and zinc rods with a bulb and a key in series with it. The dilute sulfuric acid in the vessel is called the electrolyte. When the key is pressed, we observe that the bulb glows. This shows that the chemical reaction occurring in the electrolyte causes the current through the connecting wires, lighting up the bulb. A series of chemical reactions takes place in the electrolyte. Dilute sulfuric acid breaks up into positive hydrogen ions and negative sulfate ions. This is called dissociation. The hydrogen ions move towards the copper rod. The zinc atoms from the rod ionize, losing two electrons per atom to release positive zinc ions into the solution. The zinc rod is now negatively charged as the electrons obtained by the ionization of zinc atoms remain on the rod and give a negative charge to it. Thus, it acts as the cathode or the negative pole of the cell. The two electrons flow into the external circuit causing electric current to flow. The electrons passing through the external circuit reach the copper rod. They combine with the hydrogen ions on the rod. And form hydrogen molecules. The negative sulfate ions in the solution combine with positive zinc ions to form zinc sulfate molecules. Since electrons are removed from the copper rod, 
it turns positively charged. Thus, it acts as the anode or the positive pole of the cell. We observe that outside the cell, electrons flow from the zinc rod to the copper rod, which is from the negative pole to the positive pole. We consider conventional electric current to be the flow of positive charges, which is opposite to the direction of the flow of electrons. Thus, Outside the cell, current passes from the positive pole to the negative pole. There are two defects in a voltaic cell. They are local action and polarization. The zinc used in the cell is not pure. There are carbon and iron particles in the zinc rod. These particles react with sulfuric acid with zinc forming innumerable tiny cells. This results in the formation of local electric circuits. This is called the local action in a voltaic cell. When the cell starts functioning, the amount of hydrogen gas accumulated as a layer at the copper rod increases with time. The hydrogen restricts the flow of ions and gives rise to electrical resistance in the cell. Due to this, an electric current in the opposite direction is created. This defect is called polarization. Polarization can be reduced by using a suitable oxidizing agent called a depolarizer. Potassium dichromate, copper sulfate, concentrated nitric acid, and manganese dioxide are some chemicals used as depolarizers. These two defects reduce the EMF of the cell. To overcome these defects in the voltaic cell, another cell called the Daniel cell was invented in 1836 by John Frederick Daniel, a British chemist. Daniel searched for a way to eliminate the hydrogen bubble problem in the voltaic cell. His solution was to use a second electrolyte to consume the hydrogen produced by the first. The Daniel cell consists of a central zinc rod dipped into a porous earthenware pot containing a zinc sulfate solution. The porous pot is immersed into a solution of copper sulfate contained in a copper can. The copper can acts as the positive electrode or anode and the zinc rod as the negative electrode or cathode. The use of a porous barrier allows ions to pass through but keeps the solutions from mixing. Without this barrier, when no current is drawn, copper ions move to the zinc anode and undergo reduction without producing a current. However, with the porous spot in the cell, over time, a copper buildup would block the pores in the porous spot and cut short the battery's life. Even then, the Daniel cell provides a longer and more reliable current than the voltaic cell because the electrolyte deposits copper, which is a conductor, rather than hydrogen, which is an insulator, on the cathode. It was also safer and less corrosive. One of the disadvantages of the Daniel cell is the use of a liquid electrolyte. This makes it inconvenient to carry from one place to another. Let us now discuss another primary cell, the Leclanc cell or wet cell. The cell was invented by Georges Leclanc in 1886. In Leclanc's original cell, the depolarizer, which consisted of crushed manganese dioxide and carbon, was packed into a porous pot. A carbon rod was inserted in the pot to act as the anode or positive pole. The 
cathode or the negative pole which was a zinc rod was then immersed along with the pot into a solution of ammonium chloride in a glass vessel. The liquid solution acts as the electrolyte permeating through the porous pot to make contact with the anode. The chemical process which produces electricity in a Leclanc cell starts when zinc atoms on the surface of the zinc rod give up two electrons to become positively charged ions. As the zinc ions move away from the cathode, leaving their electrodes on its surface, it becomes more negatively charged. When the cell is connected in an external electrical circuit, the electrons on the zinc anode flow through the circuit to the carbon rod. The motion of electrons through the external circuit constitutes the electric current. When the electrons reach the carbon rod, they combine with manganese dioxide and water, which react with each other to produce manganese oxide and negatively charged hydroxide ions. This is accompanied by another reaction in which the negative hydroxide ions react with positive ammonium ions in the ammonium chloride electrolyte to produce molecules of ammonia and water. The overall chemical reaction in the functioning of the cell is as shown here. The EMF produced by a Leclanc cell is of the order of 1.5 volts. It is not suitable for maintaining a steady current over a long time. Another primary cell is the bichromate cell. In this cell, chromic acid is used as a depolarizer. The chromic acid was usually made by acidifying a solution of potassium dichromate with sulfuric acid. The old name for potassium dichromate was potassium bichromate. And hence, the cell was often called a bichromate cell. The cell was made in two forms. The first one was the single fluid type, attributed to Johann Christian Poggendorf, a German physicist. The second one was the two fluid type, attributed to Fuller. In both the cases, the EMF produced is of the order of 2 volts. Here, we will discuss only the first type. The cell was set up in a long-necked glass bottle with a zinc plate located between two carbon plates. The electrolyte was a mixture of potassium dichromate and sulfuric acid. This mixture would dissolve the zinc plate even when the cell was not in use. So, there was a mechanism for lifting the zinc plate out of the liquid and storing it in the neck of the bottle. To generate electric current, the zinc rod reacts with the electrolyte to get a negative charge, becoming the cathode. The carbon plates together act as the anode. Let us now study the dry cell, which is a modification of the Leclanc cell. The modification in a dry cell is the use of a thick paste as the electrolyte, unlike liquid electrolyte in the Leclanc cell. Due to this, the dry cell can be used in any position and does not spill the electrolyte even when inverted. In a dry cell, a graphite or carbon rod is provided at the center, which functions purely as a conductor and acts as the anode. It is surrounded by a powdered mixture of graphite and manganese dioxide. This powder in turn is surrounded by paste of ammonium chloride and zinc chloride. The two pastes are separated by a thin porous sheet. This whole setup is encased in a thin zinc cylinder lined inside with cardboard. This container acts as the negative electrode and also as the container for the cell. 
the material in the cell is sealed with a pitch at the top. The carbon rod in the center has a metal cap and serves as the contact point to the external circuit. The carbon rod is prevented from coming in contact with the base of the zinc can by a cardboard washer. Let us now discuss the generation of electric current by the dry cell. In a dry cell, the ammonium chloride paste acts as the electrolyte. When the dry cell is connected to an external circuit, ammonium chloride decomposes into positive ammonium ions and negative chloride ions. The ammonium ions move towards the carbon rod and the chloride ions to the zinc vessel. This creates a positive potential at the carbon rod and a negative potential at the zinc container. Zinc reacts with chloride ions to form zinc chloride with the liberation of electrons. These electrons travel through the external circuit to reach the carbon electrode and combine with positive ammonium ions to form ammonia and hydrogen. This hydrogen accumulates as a layer around the positive carbon electrode and restricts the flow of ions. This decreases the electric current in the circuit. However, the decrease in electric current is prevented by the powdered manganese dioxide in the cell, which reacts with hydrogen and oxidizes it. Thus, manganese dioxide acts as the depolarizer. The EMF produced by a dry cell is of the order of 1.5 volts. The chemical reactions taking place in the dry cell are very slow. Hence, the reactions occur for a longer period of time. This gives dry cells a longer life as compared to the primitive voltaic cell and other cells. However, this cell cannot be used again once the chemicals in it are exhausted. Besides, the cell cannot be used incessantly. This is because if the rate of formation of hydrogen in the cell is greater than the rate of its reaction with manganese dioxide, it leads to a restriction to the flow of charges and decreases the current in the external circuit. The use of the cell has to be stopped for a while to give the hydrogen sufficient time to react with the manganese dioxide. Nowadays, cells of much smaller size as compared to dry cells are used. These are called button cells. They are compact and have a longer life as compared to dry cells. Two common types of button cells are the mercury oxide cell and the silver oxide cell. A mercury oxide cell has mercury oxide as the positive electrode and zinc as the negative electrode. In a silver oxide cell, silver oxide acts as the positive electrode and zinc as the negative electrode. You already know that the device that helps to maintain a constant potential difference across a conductor and hence a continuous flow of charge through it is called an electric cell. You also know that there are two types of cells, namely primary and secondary cells. You studied primary cells in the previous module. In this module, 
you will learn about secondary cells. When a conductor is connected to the terminals of an electric cell, the chemical reaction in the cell helps maintain the flow of charges through the conductor. Due to this reason, these are also referred to as electrochemical cells. The work done by a cell to drive a unit positive charge in a closed circuit is called electromotive force or EMF. Thus, an electrochemical cell is defined as a device that converts chemical energy into electrical energy. The chemical reaction is reversible in the case of secondary cells. Thus, a secondary cell can be recharged and reused. The lead acid battery, the nickel iron cell and the nickel cadmium cell are some examples of secondary cells. The lead acid battery, the oldest rechargeable battery, was invented by French physicist Planté in 1859. In a lead acid battery, the chemical reactions that are responsible for producing electricity can be reversed. Current is passed through the battery to start the chemical reaction. This reaction restores the chemicals that are initially present in the cell. Thus, the cell can be used again. The process of restoring the chemicals that are initially present in the cell and are responsible for generating electricity is called charging. A lead acid battery, also called a lead accumulator battery, has several grid type lead plates. These plates are coated with litharge. Litharge is one of the natural mineral forms of lead monoxide, PBO. The plates are placed inside a cuboidal glass jar containing dilute sulfuric acid, which is the electrolyte, and are joined alternately. The relative density of sulfuric acid is about 1.18. Alternate plates are connected to form two terminals. One terminal is the positive and the other is the negative. The litharge coated plates get converted into lead sulfate on reacting with sulfuric acid. The cell is connected to a source of electricity for charging. The current causes the electrolysis of dilute sulfuric acid in the battery. Thus, positive hydrogen ions and negative sulfate ions are formed. The sulfate ions move towards the positive electrode, which is the anode. Simultaneously, the hydrogen ions move towards the negative electrode, which is the cathode. The chemical reactions at the anode and the cathode are as shown here. On charging the battery, lead peroxide, PbO2, is formed at the anode, while spongy lead, Pb, is formed at the cathode. When the cell is completely charged, the relative density of the electrolyte increases from 1.18 to 1.25, and the EMF obtained from the battery is 2.2 volts. Discharging the battery is drawing current from it. When current is drawn from the cell through an external circuit, represented as the load, positive hydrogen ions move towards the anode and negative sulfate ions move towards the cathode. Electrons accumulate at the cathode and it becomes electron rich. Simultaneously, the anode becomes deficient in electrons. The chemical reactions that take place in the battery at the cathode and the anode are as shown here. The difference in the deficiency and abundance of electrons at the two electrodes create a potential difference between them.
and this causes electric current through the external circuit. Hence, conventional current passes from the anode to the cathode in the external circuit. Simultaneously, lead sulfate forms at the two electrodes. As the current is drawn from the battery, the EMF decreases gradually from more than 2.2 volts to 1.8 volts. In addition, due to an increase in the formation of water in the battery, the relative density of the electrolyte decreases gradually from 1.25 to about 1.18. In comparison to a dry cell, a lead acid battery has a higher EMF. Once exhausted, it can be recharged and reused. However, a lead acid battery is costlier and heavier than a dry cell. The sulfuric acid, if not handled properly, may cause damage to life and property. Now, let us study another type of secondary cell, the nickel cadmium cell. The first nickel cadmium battery was created by Valdemar Jagner of Sweden in 1899. When Jagner built the first nickel cadmium batteries, he used nickel oxide in the cathode and iron and cadmium in the anode. It was later that pure cadmium metal and nickel hydroxide were used. The electrolyte used in a nickel cadmium cell is potassium hydroxide. The negative electrode in the cell is made of nickel hydroxide and the positive electrode of cadmium hydroxide. The nominal EMF of a nickel cadmium cell is 1.25 volts. The advantage of a nickel cadmium cell is that it is a true storage battery with a reversible chemical reaction. Let us now study the solar cell. A solar cell converts sunlight into electricity. Silicon, a semiconductor material, is used in solar cells. When sunlight is incident on the silicon plate of the solar cell, it absorbs light and converts it into electrical energy. Several solar cells are connected together to form a solar panel. The energy obtained from a solar panel is much higher than the energy obtained from a single solar cell. The table here compares primary and secondary cells. In primary cells, chemical energy is converted into electrical energy, whereas in secondary cells, electrical energy is converted into chemical energy and chemical energy is converted into electrical energy again. In primary cells, the chemical reactions are irreversible, whereas in secondary cells, they are reversible. Primary cells cannot be recharged, but secondary cells can be recharged and used again and again. James, what are you up to? Hey Tina, I'm making an electric circuit using different components. Looks complicated. How do you figure out where to place each component? 
I'm using a book to guide me. The book contains circuit diagrams. In this lesson, you will learn about creating circuits using circuit diagrams. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to explain the significance of circuit diagrams and symbols used in them. Interpret different symbols for electric components. Describe a battery and identify its symbol. And draw a circuit diagram using the symbols for electric components. So how does the diagram help you? The circuit diagram is a simplified pictorial representation of an electric circuit using standard symbols of electric components. It helps me in placing the components and connecting them in the right way to form a circuit. I think you know what an electric circuit is, right? Of course! I've learned about it at school. An electric circuit is a closed path formed by the interconnection of electric components through which an electric current can flow. That's right. So you have the basic idea of what makes up a circuit. Hmm. I can identify the components when I see them in the circuit. But I can't really identify the components from the diagram you're referring to. Wouldn't proper drawings of the components be more helpful? There could be so many types of batteries, wires and so on. If we try to draw the actual components, it would be difficult and time consuming. We use symbols to represent different things because they are standardized and are easy to understand and draw. Let me explain. If you think about it, you will realize that we use a lot of common symbols in our everyday life. Remember the symbol for danger shown on railway crossings or electric poles? Yeah, a skull and bones. That's a common enough symbol. Can you think of any other symbols that you have seen in your day-to-day -day life? Of course. I've seen symbols for the sun, walk signal at pedestrian crossings, no entry, a wheel and a restroom. Hmm. It would be difficult to draw an actual restroom as an indicator, right? Yes. I see what you mean. It does make sense to use symbols. So, what are the symbols for different electric components? Let's see. I will show you the symbols of some commonly used electric components. Tina, could you get my toolbox, please? Pass me the items in the toolbox. I will connect each item and show you how it is represented by a symbol on the diagram in the book. Here's a wire. This is the symbol for a wire. Let's see. I've taken out a switch now. There are two symbols for the switch. One for the on position and the other for the off position. I will keep the switch in the off position for now. Let me connect the wire to the switch. So what's the symbol for this? This is the symbol for a cell. The positive terminal of a cell is represented by a vertical long line, while the negative terminal is shown as a parallel shorter line. Now, let me see. According to the diagram, I need to connect the cell to the wire. There. Let me see what's next. Here's a bulb. 
This is the symbol for a bulb. That's the last component I need to connect to this circuit as per the circuit diagram in the book. There, the circuit is complete. If the circuit has been connected properly as the book said, then why isn't the bulb glowing? The bulb is not glowing because the switch is in the off position and no current is flowing through the circuit. If current does not flow through a circuit, then it is said to be incomplete or an open circuit. It has the switch in the off position. Let me flick the switch to on. Wow! The bulb is glowing now. That's because now current is flowing through the circuit. A circuit is said to be complete when current flows through it. It is said to be a closed circuit. It has the switch in the on position. Now let's have a quick recap. Now, let's go one step further. Let's see if you're able to recognize the next symbol that I draw. That looks like the symbol for many cells connected together. That's good, Tina. This symbol does show many cells connected together. And it is a symbol for a battery. A battery is a combination of two or more cells connected together. It is formed by connecting the positive terminal of one cell to the negative terminal of another cell. Oh, I get it. That's why the symbol for a battery has the long lines, each showing the positive terminal, and the short lines, each showing the negative terminal of a cell alternately drawn one after the other. That's absolutely right. We use batteries in many devices such as motorcycles, torchlights, mobile phones, wristwatches and calculators. If a circuit that you're building requires relatively more power, you can use a battery rather than a single cell. For example, if we want to use a bulb in a circuit, then to make it glow, we need to connect a battery instead of a cell, as the bulb will require more power. Tina, now that you're familiar with the symbols used for different components in a circuit, do you think you can draw a circuit diagram? For instance, look at this circuit that I just set up. Can you make a drawing of it? Of course. Let me draw and show it to you. Here's the bulb, then the switch, which is in the off position, then the battery with two cells in it, and finally the wires connecting them all. There. I have the circuit diagram ready. Did you know a circuit diagram is also known as an electrical diagram, wiring diagram, elementary diagram or electronic schematic? Good, Tina. The circuit diagram is almost correct. You have just made one small mistake though. Can you spot the error yourself? Oh! I drew the switch in the on position, whereas in the circuit, the switch is in the off position. Let me correct it. Yes, now it's perfect. A word of caution. Always remember 
not to touch a lighted electric bulb, a generator, an inverter, or any electrical appliance that is connected to the mains of an electric supply. You may get an electric shock, which may be dangerous. It is always safe to experiment using only electric cells and a torch light bulb for any activity related to electricity. This brings us to the end of the lesson on electric components. In this lesson, you learned to Explain the significance of circuit diagrams and symbols used in them. Interpret different symbols for electric components in a circuit diagram. Describe a battery and identify its symbol. And draw a circuit diagram using symbols for electric components. is very busy trying to make a circuit. He couldn't find a metal wire and is trying to make a circuit with different materials. Let's see if this circuit works. Hey! Why doesn't the bulb glow? Because you're trying to connect the circuit using an insulating material instead of the normal metal wire. Wool is an insulator and does not allow electricity to pass through it. You need a conductor to create a circuit. In this lesson, you will learn about conductors and insulators. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to define conductors and insulators, categorize materials as conductors or insulators, and identify the applications of conductors and insulators. Insulating material does not allow electricity. I'm not sure what you mean. Let me explain. All materials do not allow electricity to pass through them. Like me. I don't allow electricity to pass through me. It won't be much use putting me in this circuit. Right. Wooly, you don't worry. I'm explaining to Sunny about that. Sunny, materials that allow electricity to pass through them are called conductors. Cool! What materials are conductors then? Me! 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 All metals are good conductors of electricity. This is the reason why electric wires are made of metal. So you're saying insulators are materials that do not allow electricity to pass through them, right? That's right. Like Mr. Woolley here. As you saw, if you use insulators in your circuit, you won't be able to make the bulb glow. Do you want to know about other friends in Mr. Woolley's club? Members of Mr. Woolley's club have other insulators like cotton, glass, wood, plastic and thermocol. Did you know our bodies and water are good conductors of electricity? But 
water in its purest form called distilled water is an insulator can we move on to the conductors club now sure as i told you earlier any metal is a good conductor of electricity and we need conducting material to make electrical circuits that's the reason why we need metallic wires to make electrical circuits remember the torch you made some days ago let's take a look at it again here it is now look at the wires that you have used they are conductors of electricity even the metal paper clip that you used as a switch is a conductor yes i remember what about the thermocol to which we fixed the thumb tacks that's an insulator then exactly in fact there is another material in the circuit that you can't see which is an insulator uh, what's that well think about it air is present everywhere in the room right right i didn't think of that so air fills the gap between the two pins that form the switch it also fills the gaps in the thermocol sheet do you get it air belongs to my club as well it does not conduct electricity woolly is right look the bulb in the circuit did not glow until the switch was put in the on position by connecting the two pins i see what you mean so air is also an insulator did you know telegraph lines were the first electrical systems that used insulators I never realized conductors are so important. Don't underestimate the insulator family. You wouldn't be able to use electrical appliances without our help. Really? How's that? Aren't all electrical appliances that we use made of conductors? They are. But have you ever examined the covering of an appliance? Like the cover of a plug that we hold to put it in a socket or the covering on the wire it's plastic and plastic is an insulator right so coverings of electrical appliances are made of insulators in fact all the parts of appliances that we touch are covered with insulating materials but why to protect you from electric shocks that's why Electricity has a dangerous side too, you know. Did you know a powerful electric shock can be fatal? It is always good to be careful while working with electricity. Oh, I hadn't realized that. I need both insulators and conductors working together for my electric appliances. This brings us to the end of this lesson on electric conductors and insulators. In this lesson, you have learned to define conductors and insulators, categorize materials as conductors or insulators, and you will also be able to identify the applications of conductors and insulators.